Hello and welcome back to University United Methodist Church in East Lansing, Michigan, where we are daring each other to love God and our neighbor. We are an inclusive congregation and we welcome everyone here at University United Methodist. My name is Bill and I am glad you have chosen to join us. Next week, we will celebrate Holy Communion. If you need communion elements, please contact the church office by email or telephone or on Facebook and you can either arrange to pick those up or we can bring them to your home. I wanna remind you that on Wednesdays during Lent, Connie Gamage is providing uh, biblical readings from the Psalms and musical meditations for the Lenten season. And finally, you're invited to join together with others and myself on a Zoom call following uh, the service for a time of, of visiting and fellowship questions and answers, you can email me at bbills at e-l-u-u-m-c dot o-r-g and I'll send you the link. Or if you just check the comment section in the Facebook feed or on the YouTube channel, the link will appear there as well. At this time, Chris Mellon will lead us in the call to worship. Please read responsively the call to worship. From generation to generation, God names us and claims us. Blessed be the Lord our God. Let us all draw breath from back to the Lord. Let the faithful rejoice in the mysteries of our God. Let heaven and earth praise God's holy name.
Let us pray together. Name above all names, visit us in our dreams and shake us from our waking nightmares. For we are tired of stumbling in the dark, blindly following the human teachings and placidly heeding human advice. When we lose our way and wander from your path, we need your love to heal us and your grace to complete us. When the forces of destruction close around us, grant us the, the strength to follow Christ. Love us back onto the right paths and restore to us life through your faithful and transforming love. Amen. Hi friends, happy Sunday. Have you ever tattled? Now, I don't mean the kind of situation where you need a grown-up's help to come and resolve a situation or somebody's not safe. I mean telling somebody else's business to try and get them in trouble or to try and avoid getting in trouble yourself. Or have you ever been tattled on and gotten in trouble? How did you feel? This, this is a very old picture. That's me when I was four. This is my cousin. Her name is Leah and she's two years older than me. And she and I are best friends, even now. So close actually that sometimes we tell people that we're sisters. She and I didn't grow up in the same house, and as a matter of fact, we didn't even live in the same state, but any time there was a family gathering, we were like this, always adventuring, always playing together. And for one week every summer when I was a child, I got to go to my grandma and grandpa's house, and Leah would come and stay with me. No big brother, no mom and dad, no aunts and uncles and cousins to have to share space with. Just the four of us. It was really special and kind of magical. My grandparents lived out in the country, which was so different from where I was growing up as a child that it felt really special. And Leah and I got to be like real sisters for that week, doing everything together and sometimes fighting and playing a bunch and sometimes getting into trouble. There was one time that I came for a visit and she and I were exploring the things that were packed away in my suitcase. My mom had sent a little brown bottle with an eyedropper on the end of it and it had hydrogen peroxide in it which is a thing that you might have used if you had a cut or a wound on your body before. But I used to get swimmer's ear a lot as a child. So my mom sent it along in case I was going to go swimming in a lake or a pool to help clean my ears out and prevent swimmer's ear. Leah had never seen hydrogen peroxide before. And I told her that when the drops went in my ears, they bubbled. They sounded like Rice Krispies. They went up, 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 up. And she didn't believe me. She thought I was making it up. And I got frustrated because I knew I was telling the truth and she got curious. And so we decided that we were going to experiment. Now, we already knew, we already had a sense in our gut and our, in our feelings that probably if grandma and grandpa knew about it, they wouldn't approve. No, we probably shouldn't be experimenting with hydrogen peroxide. So we decided if we were going to do that, we would have to do it somewhere that was private and easy to hide. So for some reason, it's been a minute since I was a little girl, so I can't tell you exactly why, but for some reason, we decided to pull the sheets back on our bed and do our experiment right there. So we put out a little pool of toothpaste and a little pool of shampoo all from my travel kit and started dropping hydrogen peroxide onto the different things. Now, I will tell you right now, this is not an experiment worth doing. Hydrogen peroxide doesn't do anything if there isn't bacteria to react to. And so it just looked like drops of water and a mess that we didn't know how to clean up or what to do with and we knew that we'd get in trouble. 
So when we were done, we pulled the sheets up over the mess and pretended it wasn't there. Well, later that day, my grandma went into the bedroom to tidy up and she went to make the bed and she found our mess. I did not like being in trouble as a child and so I immediately confessed and told her everything that happened and my grandma told Leah that she should have been older and known better and shouldn't have asked in the first place. I didn't feel good because I had tattled and Leah was mad at me and Leah didn't feel good because she was in trouble with grandma. We both did something wrong and neither one of us wanted to take ownership of it. We had to help clean up the bed and do the sheets and promise we wouldn't do it again. And our grandma never stopped loving us. That didn't change. She was frustrated. The thing is, is that when we make a mistake, when we make poor choices or we hurt somebody's feelings, when we're honest about it, when we take responsibility for our actions, it means that we get to say we're sorry. And it means that we get to try and do better and learn from our mistakes. When we try to push off responsibility on other people, it ends up with a lot of people who are frustrated and who don't feel good anyway. It hurts relationships and it hurts people. Today's scripture comes from our epistles, our letters in the New Testament, and it is about Paul. Now, do you remember Paul is the man who didn't like Christians and he was doing unkind and awful things and then he met Jesus and his heart was changed and then he went and helped build the church. So he is encouraging another new church leader in this scripture and let's listen to what he has to say. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would, be, for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. So Paul is encouraging Timothy, telling him that he has to be humble and honest about his mistakes, but that God's grace and the love of Jesus will always be big enough. There will never be a moment in Timothy's life or in my life or in your life where we can do something that makes God stop loving us. But we have to learn and be humble and grow through our bad choices so that we can be more like Jesus in this world. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for loving us no matter what. Help us to remember when it's time to say we are sorry. Help us to, to take responsibility even when it feels uncomfortable. Help us make good choices and help us to forgive those who have not made good choices in our lives. Be with us this week and help us be a reflection of your love in this world. Amen. Bye, friends. Have a great week. Today's scripture reading is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 19. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. 
even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came unto the world to save sinners, of whom I am the former, foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, and the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you might fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Is there anything more fun than confessing other people's sins? Most of us probably don't realize how good we are at that, confessing other people's sins. For example, Texas is in a serious state of emergency and a meme is making the rounds on social media describing Ted Cruz as a brave father willing to cross the border with Mexico to find running water, electricity, and heat for his family. That's too easy. What he did was a bad idea, and it's easy to criticize him. Paul wrote that the saying is sure and worthy of acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Today, it's very common for people to publicly pick others apart with scathing criticism, if not even outright lies about them. But Paul isn't confessing the sins of others, only his own. Now, some people contend that Peter was the greatest apostle, and tradition tells us that Peter was considered to be the first pope, the bishop of Rome. Tradition, though, also refers to Paul as the apostle. Many historians believe that had it not been for Paul, Christianity might not have survived. But Paul never called himself the greatest, except when it came to confessing his own sin. Instead, Paul describes himself as a blasphemer, a slanderer. He calls himself a man of violence, a persecutor of his enemies, insolent, and reckless. But he was also a Pharisee, blameless in keeping the law of Moses. And he was a hero to those who hated the same people whom Paul hated. And of course, everybody loves a good conversion story, but we must never forget that Paul was a zealous persecutor of Christians. He was relentless and he was violent. He called himself the foremost of sinners. Would any of us ever want to claim that title for ourselves, the foremost of sinners? Probably not. But if I asked you to nominate someone else for that title, you could probably do so very quickly. It's easy to confess the sins of others. And sometimes we even think it's fun. Consider George Wallace, the four-time governor of Alabama and presidential candidate. In his 1963 inauguration address, Wallace famously said 
He believed in segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. He ran political campaigns on enforcing racist Jim Crow laws. He stood in the doorway of the University of Alabama and personally tried to keep the first black students out of that university. In 1968, George Wallace ran as an independent candidate on a segregationist platform for the office of President of the United States of America. Wallace was a proud, enthusiastic, and zealous racist who also that year won five states in the Electoral College. Jimmy Carter once said Wallace ran the most racist campaign that he had ever seen. Wallace was a proud public persecutor. Or consider the late Rush Limbaugh, another proud public persecutor. Limbaugh came to define conservative talk radio over the last 30 or so years with his very personal and sometimes sweepingly general hateful remarks about anyone whom he disliked. He had no qualms about calling feminists Nazis. He took delight in making fun of gay men who were dying of AIDS. He had no problem singling out a young woman and publicly labeling her a slut on air during his radio program. Rush Limbaugh made vitriol commonplace in the public square and he made millions of dollars attacking people. And the former president of our United States rewarded him for all of that with a medal. So would St. Paul consider giving up his title of foremost of the sinners to someone like Rush Limbaugh or George Wallace? Now we often refer to him as St. Paul, but Paul never claimed that title for himself. According to Paul, it was ordinary people, ordinary Christians who were the real saints. The title he took for himself was the foremost of sinners. He described himself as one not even worthy to be called an apostle. So how does he stack up against a Rush Limbaugh or a George Wallace? Was Paul ever that bad? Or could Rush or George ever become a saint? Now, Paul had some very legitimate authority. He was a Pharisee, a biblical scholar, blameless under the law of Moses. He was a citizen of the empire and he was commissioned by religious leaders. He had support and encouragement from powerful others in his relentless quest to harm people. Paul believed in what he was doing. His self-righteousness, he felt, entitled him to be mean. And it would seem that George Wallace and Rush Limbaugh felt justified and supported in their relentless quests to be mean and to persecute people. And both of them enjoyed support from religious leaders just like Paul did. If either of those men claimed religious conversion, would you believe them? The scriptures tell us that Paul had a serious credibility problem even after his conversion experience on the Damascus Road. Because Christians already knew who he was and his reputation with Christians was not good. This is the man who stood by at the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and approved of his execution. 
This is the man of whom it was said he went around breathing threats of murder against the Christians. Paul had Christians arrested and jailed and maybe even executed. But after that, after all of that, he became the great apostle. So if it could happen to him, could it happen to someone else like a Rush Limbaugh or a George Wallace? Now, in 1972, I was only 13 years old, but I remember Arthur Bremer's assassination attempt on George Wallace during the presidential primary campaign season. Wallace was shot twice while campaigning in Maryland. And he remained paralyzed from his waist down after that assassination attempt until his death in 1998. There's no way to really know for sure, but maybe that was George Wallace's Damascus Road conversion experience. But I hate to think that it takes something like that to change someone's heart. But some folks are just plain stubborn. Paul was confronted on the Damascus Road right in the middle of his persecution of innocent Christians. And in his vision at that time, Paul heard Jesus say, Why are you persecuting me? Jesus took Paul's persecution of innocent people personally. To persecute the innocent, Jesus said, was to persecute him. But when confronted by Jesus, Paul's fanatical ideology was forced to give way to God's grace. And Paul, at that point, was changed. But he kept for himself the title of foremost sinner as a reminder, a constant reminder to himself of the greatness of God's grace. In the late 1970s, George Wallace publicly announced that he was a born-again Christian. He publicly apologized to black civil rights leaders for his past actions as a, seg as a segregationist. He said that while he had once sought power and glory, he realized that he now needed to seek grace, love, and forgiveness. In 1979, Wallace said of his stand in the Al University of Alabama schoolhouse door, he said, I was wrong. Those days are over and they ought to be over. The rabid segregationist asked for forgiveness from those whom he had harmed. Something changed for George Wallace, just as something changed for Paul. Did anything ever change for Rush? Over the last five years in particular, ours has become a double down culture, especially in politics, but also in the public arena in general and on social media in particular. If you say something outrageous and people criticize you, it's fashionable now to just keep doubling down, go bigger. Even if you get caught in an outright lie, double down, go big. And keep doubling down, conventional wisdom says, until people get used to it and they stop arguing with you. If they don't get used to it or they try to hold you accountable, then just blame somebody else. If you get caught going to Cancun to escape a huge natural disaster in your own state, blame it on your daughters. Making up lies and doubling down is considered virtuous by some people today. And to apologize, to admit that you made a mistake, to say that you're sorry is considered a sign of weakness for many, especially in political circles. 
If you want to be powerful, if you want to be respected, if you want to be admired, then keep doubling down even if you are very wrong. Stopping the lies, apologizing though, is how the foremost sinner became the great apostle. Paul stopped doubling down. He admitted his mistakes. He received grace. And he took the high road. But what if he had kept doubling down? What if Paul had refused to take a good look at himself, what he was doing, how his Jesus could never possibly have been the Messiah conspiracy theory, what if he had never taken a look at these things and how he was using these things to harm people? What if history today remembered Paul as the man who single-handedly crushed the Christian movement before it ever really even got started? Seeing the way things worked out for Paul, we naturally assume that his conversion was sincere. He really did seem to have a genuine change of heart. Now, George Wallace admitted to being a power-hungry segregationist most of his life, but something seems also to have changed in him as well. And some probably doubt or doubted his sincerity. And it can be really easy for any of us to second-guess conversion stories. But his eternal life doesn't depend on you or me and our willingness to forgive or extend to him grace. It is dependent solely on God. In Rush Limbaugh, was there ever any hope for Rush? Maybe it's too late now. But there was also, I think, a difference between Rush and George and Paul. Paul and George chose to stop doubling down. They instead took a good, long, hard look at themselves and the harm they inflicted on other people. And they actually had the backbone, they had the courage to stop doubling down. They had the courage to admit that they were mistaken. They had the courage to take responsibility and ask for forgiveness from the people they had harmed. The grace of God is greater than any human sin. So what about Rush? So many people loved him. And he made millions of dollars. Did he ever wonder if what he was doing was wrong? <clears throat> he always seemed so sure of himself. This is a hard thing to consider. Remember that once upon a time, Paul was a first-class jerk. But he admitted that much. He was sure he was right. Therefore, he felt justified in inflicting harm on innocent people. When confronted by God, he realized he was wrong. He owned it, and he said so. And he was given grace. He received grace. He became the living embodiment of the gospel. The lost was found. The wretch was saved because he stopped doubling down. He stopped being a jerk. He was willing to admit that he was wrong and ask to be forgiven. And maybe that's the point at which God draws the line. Stop doubling down Thus says the Lord. Now, divine grace, 
does not mean that God loves us so much that we can lie and double down and lie and double down and lie and double down and keep doing it forever. Divine grace doesn't mean that we can insult or harm other people and expect to be forgiven over and over and over. God does not let those kind of things slide indefinitely. Nobody can harm people on purpose for profit or power or popularity and expect to get a pass forever. At some point, we're all going to come face to face with God. And believe me, that is not the time to double down once again. You see, at some point, before we come face to face with God, the doubling down has to stop. The mistakes have to be owned. Then anyone can be forgiven and anyone can receive divine grace. And you know what? God may be the only one who accepts that apology. And while that may be hard, especially for the repentant sinner, it will be enough. Amen. Jesus
Would you please bow with me now in prayer? <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, for your immense and wondrous and eternal grace, we are always grateful for the love and for the mercy that you continually offer to us. We are ever grateful. We give thanks to you for your promise to love us and to care for us, to heal us and to lift us up. We thank you for your willingness to accept us even when we disappoint you, when we disappoint others, when we disappoint ourselves. We can take great comfort and hope in knowing that your promise of mercy and forgiveness is unbounded. And therefore, we pray that you would help us always to be mindful of this great grace that you offer to all people. And we pray that you would give us the courage, the character and the conviction of our faith to always be willing to take a good look at ourselves. Give us the courage to be willing to own our mistakes, to ask for forgiveness from you, and to seek to be reconciled to any whom we might have harmed, either intentionally or unintentionally. We pray that your grace and your goodness might overflow, overflow from our lives and our hearts into the lives and hearts of others. We pray that your grace and your goodness might live in us as we live in our communities and our workplaces, our schools, our homes, that your grace and your goodness and mercy might be shared with others. Help us, O oh God, not only to be willing to confront our own misdeeds and acts of injustice toward others, but help us to confront these things more generally as well so that we can play a role in affecting justice and reconciliation in the lives of other people. We thank you, God, that you love us and care for us so much. We thank you that there is nothing that we might think, say, or do that is beyond your grace. We thank you that you give us the courage and the conviction to examine our own hearts, to be known even as we are known. And in spite of our mistakes, to know that we are loved by you. We pray for your great grace, O oh God, for your mercy and for your healing spirit, that these things might be poured out upon those in our congregation whom we love and care about so much, who occupy places of concern in our hearts and in our corporate life. We pray to you, God, today for the continuing recovery and healing in the body, mind, and spirit of Pete Marvin. For Don Harrington, Tony Vincent, David Blakesley, and Claudette Parity, as they each one struggle with their own illness, Grant that they might know that you are with them and that through our prayers, we are with them as well. We pray for Howard Moore 
His son Paul and grandson Mark continue to walk with them on their long journey toward healing and wholeness. Give them peace. We pray for Sean Ilowski and for others who serve us in so many ways that often go unnoticed. We ask your continued blessings upon our missionaries in Africa, Jane and Larry Keyes, and we pray for their children as well. Bless our Bishop David, our Superintendent Jerry, and Jim, our Wesley Foundation campus minister. We pray for our community. We pray for our church. We pray for our nation. We pray to you, O God, for all of the nations of the earth, for all the peoples of the earth. We pray for your blessings, for a spirit of reconciliation, cooperation, peace and justice among all people. We pray that one day your kingdom may indeed come, that the world might know your love, your grace and your forgiveness. And we pray these things to you in Jesus' name. And as he taught us, we pray now together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, yeah.
And now may the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit, may these be with you all this day and every day of your life. Amen. Thank you.